we are organizing this first online international philosophy symposium on behalf of Ege University Department of Philosophy. Welcome to our symposium. I'd like to salute everyone who is participating in this symposium as a speaker or a participant. First of all, I would like to thank everyone who are here and who had allocated their time for this symposium. We will be having our main theme as historiography of philosophy today. And thank you very much for accepting this. Also, I'd like to thank everyone who are moderators or members of the scientific committee for the symposium. Of course, I'd like to thank everyone who are now online following our event and who will be participating in our event with their questions and in comments. I salute everyone again and welcome again. This year, for the first time, This is the first time we are organizing this international symposium on philosophy. And we are planning on organizing it periodically. That's why we called it the first international philosophy symposium. And the main theme, as I have already said, will be the historiography of philosophy today. Why we had picked up this theme, why we found this theme be worthy of discussion. What do we mean with the historiography of today? If you allow me, I would like to say a few po points and to provide you with a kind of framework. But before beginning, I have to make an explanation to our guests who are here as speakers, moderators, or the members of the scientific committee. After the first correspondence with you, we were planning on having Kenton Skinner as the inauguratory speech or the inauguratory class. We had decided this, but we haven't shared the result with you. But a few days ago, actually a few days before we had declared the program, Skinner told us that he made a miscalculation of the dates and he would not be able to be a part of the program. He said that he was so sorry for this and he asked me, for transferring his um, apologies to you. But then we recognize, uh, we became aware of that. We had forgotten to share it with you. Sorry for this negligence. Please forgive us. After this, of course, we had written to you why Skinner would not be able to be here. But still, I wanted to repeat it here. I'd like to extend my salutes to Mr. Kenton Skinner. And I'd like to thank him a lot. We hope he will be with us in the symposiums to be organized in the upcoming years. Now, we have invited various academics from various countries and Turkey. And our theme was expressed in this way. We will be looking at the objectives of why we are researching on the history of philosophy. What's the importance of uh, history of philosophy for understanding today, what are the different approaches, discourses, and if any new perspectives in historiography of philosophy. We want to discuss all this. And the framework of the meeting will be around more or less these questions. Is uh, history of philosophy and an academic and intellectual curiosity or resource topic, or is it uh, still important? If yes, why uh, it makes sense today? Different philosophers from the different ages, can they be our contemporaries or are, are we forcing to make them a part of today while they are completely foreign to us? Is there only one philosophy of history or can we speak of histories of philosophy? History of philosophy is a history of philosophy, the indispensable or unavoidable scene of the attempt to make philosophy. Is it really impossible to make philosophy with overlooking or ignoring the historical accumulation? Is a history of philosophy biased in terms of gender in other Words. Is it sexist? Are the women philosophers um, um, more important than 
it is accepted of today. When we look at uh, the old uh, philosophers of the ancient days, their ideas about nature and society are now obsolete, but why still we are researching on them? Does it make any sense except being an academic and historical curiosity and research topic? Can we discuss of new approaches and techniques in the resource of the history of philosophy? If yes, what kind of possibilities can be created through this in order to make the philosophical culture more effective and disseminated? Of course, we can multiply the questions, but I don't want to speak longer because that so far, I think we had received a general idea about the framework of our discussion. Of course, we know that how to associate ourselves with the history of philosophy, how to read and write the history of philosophy is itself a philosophical question because Anyone who is asking these sorts of questions, if he or she is attempting to write the history of philosophy or locating his or her specific studies around the axis of the history of philosophy, of course, that person will be thinking on what philosophy is, where does it start, uh, what are the relations between the philosophical thought and the other humanitarian and cultural activity areas, how to read the basic philosophical problems, that person needs to know this and to have a philosophical attitude with this regard. So that when we are discussing historiography, we all these will force the limits of so-called principle of the objectivity. In that terms, we can say that history of philosophy is not a science, but a philosophical discipline. Ironically enough, the story of philosophy is accepted to start with Aristoteles, who said that even histor history is not even as important as poetry in terms of its knowledge content. But we know that Aristotle does not only transfer the information of the past age only as historical information. He uses them while constructing his own philosophy drawing upon uh, the Ionian uh, philosophy of nature or the school of Athens, he thinks other philosophers either to be his forerunners or he is interested in them as a topic of polemic because their ideas are against his uh, ideas. Until 19th century, this uh, style of uh, historiography of uh, philosophy had been represented in the most concrete way by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. We know that Hegel thinks the history of philosophy as the dialectic moments of which are preparing the philosophical synthesis. And he writes his history of philosophy from this perspective. These two examples are actually providing us with the information that philosophical activity cannot be disconnected from the attempt to make philosophy or to make philosophy independently from its history. Of course, beginning from the 20th century, Kant's metaphysic critic had been had uh, had been pushed its uh, result by the logic positivists, uh, rational positivists, and they say that they they th think that it's not necessary to have recourse to the history of philosophy. And the rational positivists who are following Wittgenstein thought that most of the philosophical problems were arising from misunderstandings, and the philosophy had the task of removing this mistake, eliminating this mistake. This is called linguistic turn. Actually, it is important in terms of the linguistic turn, but uh, they were saying that many philosophical topics ought not to be themes of philosophy. Logical uh, positivists who are describing the sense of a uh, promise as its validation method, according to them, each response had to be based on factual ground, which are visible in the data of sense. So many purportedly philosophical problems were seen by them 
as meaningless and we have to according to them leave them to the depth of the history now in that very point when we look at to the past after one century if we are reading all these texts as text of history of philosophy i think this is very meaningful it's right after kant meta the claim that metaphysics is not subject topic of knowledge this claim had been expressed a lot but can we say that it's completely out of interest there might be ethic politics aesthetic and other concerns and interests which are not metaphysical in narrow sense but which can have metaphysic implications can we draw conclusions only from the area of the scientific activity of course we know that the basic criterion of philosophical activity is not validation or invalidation it is justification while we while we were drawing the framework the symposium we asked why it is necessary to look at the obsolete ideas of the past philosophers let me give a concrete example for example according to aristotle's biology if there is an interest in aristotle's biology can this interest make a sense beyond of academic curiosity i don't think so but look in terms of the other issues for example looking for a better life his ideas related to morality and politics are they only interesting from this point of view only as an academic curiosity so are we forcing aristotle to be our contemporary another example when we look at the relation between the religion and politics if you think that their philosophical existence is con continuing then can we say that this is completely meaningless to try uh, to make farabi or Spinoza are contemporary to make them our contemporaries to invite them before us. I don't say that this is a must, this is an obligation, but if we can justify their way of making philosophy or if we can justify their ideas from our point of view, I think they are our contemporaries with this regard and it's not, it makes sense to invite them to summon them before us also i'd like to emphasize the following the technology culture is forcing the limits of the world that we know we shouldn't only summon philosophers before us but we should go before them even rather than summoning them before us we have to be before us we have to be um, in their prevalence We cannot hear Mr. Kuyurtar at the moment. There was a disconnection. This symposium recording in is, progress. This symposium is, of course, a result of a collective study. Uh, but many, some of our members have much more effect than me and the other members of the organizing committee i'd like to thank to galip chan altenkaya and karun chekyam our speakers moderators and members of the scientific committee already know it but i want our audience know it too karun chekyam and galip chan altenkaya from the very beginning had put the idea of organizing such a symposium in our frontier they create the motivation of realizing this symposium and they also organize the process we can say that the rest we had helped them from we helped them as the others from this point of view from the point of view being their assistance i'd like to thank to soy kalyakan and Özgür soysal i'd like to thank also aiden miftoğlu and kaya Suçoğlu, the other members of the organizing committee finally i'd like to thank to aka university dean's office of Lit literature faculty and distance education center of aka university who had provided us with the technical and material possibility i'd like to thank also 
Janan Kaplan and Barış Yıldırım who are sharing this challenging process with us. Thank you very much for being with us. I'd like to extend my salutes to you. Thank you very much. Professor, Professor Kurtar, can you can you hear me? Uh, shall, we, shall we start? Shall we start? Yes, yes, we can, right. can start. Hello, hello again to everyone. Uh, in this first session of the symposium, we have two speakers, Professor Brett Davis and Professor Len Goodman. Uh, each speaker is expected to uh, have 35 minutes to present his paper. After their presentations, we will receive some questions or comments on what they have <clears throat> uh, talked about. Uh, let's begin with Professor Davis, and I would like to give a brief information about him and about his works. Brett Davis is a professor and Higgins Chair in Philosophy at Loyola University, Maryland, where he teaches classes on the histories of Asian as well as Western philosophical traditions, and where he also leads the Heart of Zen meditation group. Professor Davis has studied and taught in Germany and for many years in Japan and in the United States. He has published many books and articles in Japanese as well as in English on Zen Buddhism, the Kyoto School, Heidegger, and other continental philosophers and various issues in cross-cultural philosophy. Uh, this evening or today, uh, he is going to talk about the question of whether philosophy is Western, and he will evaluate debates among both continental and Japanese philosophers over these metaphilosophical questions. Uh, yes, Professor Davis, you may start, please. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I am fine with your voice. Okay. Uh, I'm going to share my screen as well, so let me make All sure right. this is working. And you can see my screen. Okay. Yes. Okay, I'll reduce it. Uh, okay, let me uh, begin by by thanking the uh, the organizers for um, inviting me to participate in this conference. Um, it's uh, still quite strange to be participating in international conferences from uh, my home office, um, which I didn't even have time to clean for you this morning. But uh, I hope that's okay. Um, but I, to I told my son. Uh, I a few moments ago that I'm, um, I'm going to Turkey and I'll be back later this afternoon. He looked at me with a very strange um, look. Uh, but it's quite, during the pandemic, it's quite amazing that uh, many of us have gotten used to uh, using um, Zoom to, to teach as well as to participate in these kinds of uh, international conferences. And um, thanks to this technology, this uh, has become possible. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see going forward uh, what we'll do with the technology. I hope it doesn't replace actually getting together uh, to have these kinds of conversations. I think uh, it cannot replace that. But I also hope that it multiplies the, the occasions for us to share our work and our perspectives, uh, especially on the kinds of questions that this conference is dealing with. Uh, when we try to think about uh, the historiography of philosophy, uh, and especially the, the global history or histories. It's already a question, um, as Professor Kriotar pointed out, whether we use the singular or the plural in, in that um, regard. Um, but to have the, such conversations, uh, I think we have to have them uh, internationally, uh, interculturally, and also uh, multilingually uh, as much as is possible. And so I, I really appreciate this invitation and this chance to share some of my thoughts uh, on this issue uh, with um, various people, but, uh, but predominantly a, 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 a group of, of Turkish scholars. 
and I look forward to, to hearing your, your perspectives on what I have to say. Okay, I um, am going to mainly read the text that I've prepared, uh, and in case for some people it might be um, helpful or uh, to read along with what I'm saying, I've also put my entire text on PowerPoint slides. So I will um, flip through the slides as I read, and feel free to uh, listen to the translation, or uh, just listen to my English presentation, or listen and uh, read along, whichever works best for you. So the question uh, is, is quite simply, is philosophy Western? Uh, it's a huge question, and I will just make a few comments on this question today, really. And my comments will come from certain uh, Western, uh, predominantly con continental, that's the, the Western tradition that I'm uh, trained in more than the analytic tradition, uh, or the pragmatist tradition, um, and also uh, East Asian, and especially Japanese uh, perspectives, the other tradition in which I'm trained in and, and which I work in. So let me begin with a question. Is philosophy Western? Was philosophy born and raised exclusively in the Western tradition? Or can it be found in at least some non-Western traditions? Is the phrase Western philosophy a specific restriction of a more universal field? Western philosophy, Greek philosophy, German philosophy, etc. Or is it, as Heidegger and others have claimed, a tautology, since philosophy defines the essential core of the Western tradition and the Western tradition alone? In fact, uh, Heidegger's claim, uh, I happen to be a Heidegger scholar as well, so uh, I'll mention Heidegger here in more detail, is often misunderstood and misused, since he equated philosophy with Western metaphysics, and he himself heralded, looked forward to what he called the end of philosophy. He thought ours is an age of the end of philosophy and what he called the task of thinking. In any case, the question is, if we wish to use the term philosophy in a more expansive sense, not simply Western metaphysics as Heidegger defines it, an expansive sense that's expansive enough to include, for example, the aphorisms of Heraclitus, Marcus Aurelius, Nietzsche, and Wittgenstein, as well as the later Heidegger's thinking, should it also include non-Western traditions of profound and rigorous, even if methodologically unfamiliar, thinking about fundamental matters? So that's my question. Is philosophy Western? In 2016, philosophy professors Jay Garfield and Brian uh, Van Norden published a provocative article in the stone column of the New York Times, in which they point out that the vast majority of philosophy departments in the United States offer courses only on philosophy derived from Europe and the English-speaking world, and that the profession as a whole remains resolutely Eurocentric, perpetuating the perception that philosophy departments are nothing but temples to the achievements of males of European descent. Their suggestion was that if a department is not willing to include coverage of non-Western traditions, it should rename itself Department of European and American Philosophy. Many philosophy professors and graduate students did not respond kindly to this suggestion that they rebrand their discipline as a restricted field of area studies rather than a transcultural pursuit of universal wisdom. Philosophical Eurocentrism is arguably as old as European philosophy. However, what I call philosophical Euro-monopolism, the idea that philosophy is found only in the Western tradition and its colonial offshoots, was first firmly instituted, uh, the idea is there in the early Greeks, but uh, it's first firmly instituted in the late 18th and early 19th century, that is to say, in the heyday of European colonialism, by Kant and Kantian historians of philosophy. This conceptual coup has been well documented and critically examined by a number of scholars, such as uh, Peter Park, Robert Bernasconi, and 
Franz Martin Wimmer. Elsewhere, I myself have examined the legacy of this philosophical Euro monopolism in the complicated cases of prominent 20th century continental philosophers such as Heidegger, Gadamer, and Levinas. In this short paper today, I wish to merely introduce some East Asian, and in particular Japanese, perspectives into the conversation. To begin with, however, I wish to acknowledge that the question, is philosophy Western, is in fact a thwarting one, and the stakes are very high in seeking to address it. Many of my fellow cross-cultural philosophers may want to reject, reject straight away the claim that philosophy is an exclusive possession of the Western tradition. For those of us working to diversify the philosophical field and curriculum, it is indeed tempting to reject such philosophical Euro-monopolism outright in the name of inclusiveness and diversity. And yet, if we patiently ponder the question, I think it is, in fact, presents us with a genuine dilemma that today puts philosophy in crisis. There are two horns of this dilemma in response to the question, is philosophy Western? If we say, yes, it is Western, too readily and too easily, we risk not only Eurocentric hubris, but even philosophical suicide, allowing philosophy to become, or admitting that it already is, a field of area studies concerned only with truths relative to a particular set of cultures, Western cultures. On the other hand, if we say no, philosophy is not Western, too readily and too easily, we risk not only hermeneutical obliviousness, not attending to the hermeneutical origins of the term philosophy, but also a violence of inclusion that is only, uh, so a hermeneutical violence of inclusion that's not only moderately less, that is, sorry, that is only moderately less pernicious than the violence of exclusion. So my point is that I, either way, if we include other traditions or if we exclude them, there's still a, a, an issue of, of hermeneutical violence that we need to attend to. For those who think about and on the basis of non-Western traditions and who are knocking on the door of our philosophy departments, the dilemma in question, uh, the dilemma of our question, means that they will either be excluded and ignored or admitted and distorted. So the violence of exclusion is being excluded and ignored. The violence of inclusion is being admitted, but also distorted. Uh, made to assimilate. Either we do not recognize what they do, and full disclosure what I often do, as philosophy, and we send them off to be quarantined in an area studies department, or we invite them in and force them to conform to our concepts and conception of what it means to do philosophy. Is there a way through the horns of this dilemma uh, of exclusionary versus inclusionary violence. In fact, I don't think that there is a clear path that will leave us and them unscathed. It's not an easy answer to this question. Rather, I argue, we should err on the side of taking the risk of inclusionary violence and admit non-Western traditions into the field, while at the same time striving to mitigate the inclusionary violence this inevitably entails by allowing these non-Western traditions to contribute not only different answers to our questions, but different questions. And not just different questions, but different ways of asking and answering questions. In other words, we should counteract the, inevitably in, the inevitable inclusionary violence our philosophical hospitality entails by at least at times turning this horn of inclusionary violence, this semantic and methodological violence, of distortive assimilation around on ourselves. What is required is a long and difficult practice of philosophical dialogue, a dialogue in which even the nature, means, and ends of philosophical dialogue will be in question. So in my short paper today, I'm uh, merely going to attempt to clear the way, or at least a way, 
for such a dialogue by commenting on some East Asian, in particular Japanese, as well as Western perspectives uh, on the sense and scope of philosophy. In the context of the late 19th and early 20th century, during the Meiji period, from 1868 to 1912, uh, so if, if people aren't familiar with uh, Japanese history, uh, before that, for 200 plus years, they had um, closed the country for the most part, um, and so had not uh, engaged in, in intercultural um, dialogue. But when they abruptly opened the country, uh, after they were threatened by with uh, American warships, uh, uh, especially starting in the Meiji period, Japanese intellectuals were ardently importing and appropriating Western fields of academic inquiry, including philosophy. And at this time, significant debates uh, took place over the question of whether at least some traditional, uh, and here traditional means pre-Meiji, discourses of Japan uh, Buddhist discourses, Confucian discourses, etc., could be thought of as philosophy. So this was a real live question for the Japanese uh, at the end of the 19th century and uh, into the beginning of the 20th. While some Japanese philosophers in the Meiji period, most notably uh, Inoue Tetsuro and Inoue Enryo, reconstructively presented Confucian and Buddhist discourses as philosophy. So there were philosophers at this time that uh, represented, re, re, uh, uh, worked, uh, uh, repackaged uh, these Confucian and Buddhist discourses and presented them as philosophy. In the end, the majority of Japanese scholars followed uh, Nakae Chomin's view, uh, a famous or infamous quote where he says, from ancient times to the present, there has been no philosophy in Japan. The Chinese adopt, uh, adopted most Japanese translations of Western uh, vocabulary, including the Japanese neologism for uh, philosophy. So at the time, you have to think this is a, a, a massive translation project of all of these Western terms, not just philosophical terms, but uh, scientific, arts, culture, everything. Uh, they're having to come up with a new vocabulary for this. And the Japanese did that first, using the Japanese use the same characters, the cinegraphs, as the Chinese. Uh, and so the Japanese d created that, that vocabulary first at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, uh, and the Chinese have mostly adopted that, uh, as have uh, uh, Koreans as well. And that includes the, the term, they, uh, the neologism, they created for the word philosophy. This term is made up of two characters, two sinographs, uh, that literally mean the study of wisdom. The term is pronounced, so it's the same term in Chinese and Japanese, but it's pronounced differently. It's pronounced Tetsugaku in Japanese and Jeshue in Mandarin Chinese. Yet, this is interesting, so same term, but in contrast to what became the dominant Japanese usage of this term, the Chinese have typically used it to refer not only to Western and Western-influenced discourses, but also to traditional schools of Confucian, Taoist, and Buddhist thought. So it's very you know, interesting to see how this same term, this neologism created by the Japanese to translate philosophy, the Western term philosophy, uh, and then the term is adopted by the Chinese uh, and by the Koreans, but they use the term uh, to carry uh, to, with a different um, extension, as it were, with a different range uh, of, of application, uh, and notably um, the Chinese and Korean use it to apply also to uh, their traditional discourses of Confucianism, Taoist, uh, Buddhist, and so forth. So Chinese philosophy, Zhongguo Jieshui, is a mainstay of many philosophy departments and publications in mainland China and in Hong Kong, as well as in Taiwan and Singapore. The situation is similar in Korea, where the philosophy department at, at Seoul National University teaches uh, 
what they translate into English as Oriental philosophy, along with Western philosophy. So their philosophy department has these two uh, sections, these two parts to it, uh, Oriental philosophy and Western philosophy. And then the phrase that we would translate as Korean philosophy, Hanguk Chohag, is used mainly to refer to traditional uh, Confucian and Buddhist thought. In contrast, not only to the cases of China and Korea, but also to the manner in which pre-Meiji discourses are often included in the category of Japanese philosophy uh, in Europe and the United States. So, for example, uh, the two prominent uh, resources for the field now uh, are the, the source book of Japanese philosophy, which contains translations of primary text, uh, and the Oxford uh, Handbook of Japanese philosophy, which contains uh, interpretive um, essays on, on uh, uh, Japanese philosophy. Both of these uh, uh, sort of uh, foundational field uh, establishing texts of Japanese philosophy both cover both pre Meiji and post Meiji, both uh, pre modern and modern uh, discourses. So the phrase Japanese philosophy in Europe and the United States uh, is being used predominantly to cover pre-Meiji as well as post-Meiji, pre-modern as well as, as modern uh, discourses. But in Japan itself, Tetsugaku is still mostly used to refer to Western philosophy and to post-Meiji academic discourses in Japan that engage with the texts and ideas of Western philosophy. So this includes uh, discourses uh, such as many of those of, of the famous Kyoto School uh, would certainly be included in, in Tetsugaku in philosophy in Japan. Uh, and those texts draw deeply on pre-Meiji text. Uh, and yet Tetsugaku would generally not include the pre-Meiji texts themselves. In philosophy department at Japanese used to universities, what is mainly taught is the history and contemporary discourses of Western philosophy. As in the West, Japanese and other traditions of thought are studied in other departments. As in the West, in Japan one typically means by philosophy, tetsugaku, first and foremost, Western philosophy, seiyo tetsugaku. The scholar uh, Sueki Fumihiko notes that while the terms Indian philosophy, Indo Tetsugaku, and Chinese philosophy, Chugoku Tetsugaku, have been used in Japan, you could still find you know, books uh, and there's even some departments that use these terms. Nevertheless, the model by which they are interpreted has been Western philosophy. Moreover, he knows that the trend lately has been to speak more loosely of Indian thought, Indo Shiso, and Chinese thought, uh, in fact, even some departments have renamed themselves uh, using the, the word thought, shiso, rather than tetsugaku, to talk about Indian and, and Chinese traditions. In any case, Sueki agrees with the consensus in Japan that it is better to speak of pre-Meiji discourses in terms of a history of thought rather than a history of philosophy, arguing that tetsugaku begins in Japan through the creative appropriation of Western philosophy by Meiji scholars. And he argues that one significant difference between Tetsugaku and philosophy is that the former Tetsugaku is informed by Asian and in particular Japanese traditions as well as by Western traditions. So he's uh, saying Tetsugaku applies to post-Meiji, to modern discourses but now those discourses are different from Western philosophy because they also uh, take into account um, uh, their influence by uh, and actively deal with pre-Meiji discourses as well as Western discourses. This may in fact be a compelling way of thinking about post-Meiji Japanese Tetsugaku insofar as it allows us to mark the continuities with as well as the differences from both Western philosophy and pre-Meiji thought. However, while marking the difference between philosophy in the narrow sense and a more general sense of 
thought may sometimes be a useful one, it strikes me as problematic that while Japanese scholars often note the Western and specifically Greek origins of philosophy, they generally do not attend to the fact that thought, or the term they use to translate thought, shiso, too is an originally a Western concept. So you can't get away from Western concepts just by not using uh, tetsugaku, even if you use shiso. You're still translating a Western term, thought. The main problem here is that in this context, thought is a concept often applied more loosely to discourses that are viewed as lacking the rigor of philosophy proper or philosophy in the strict sense. Chinese scholars appear to be more sensitive on this point. An interesting and also ironic case in point is their reaction to a statement uh, Derrida made at a conference in Beijing. Although, the irony is that although Derrida's own thought or theory has itself often been excluded from philosophy departments uh, in the United States and elsewhere, uh, and from the point of view of the members of those philosophy departments exiled to or quarantined in comparative literature departments. So, you know, keep it out of philosophy, uh, even though Derrida's writing all about philosophy, uh, not all, but uh, uh, largely about philosophy. And although one might have expected Derrida's deconstruction of what he calls the ethnocentric metaphysics of Western logocentrism, to have enabled and encouraged an interest in and appreciation of non-Western traditions, and in fact, uh, in some places, Derrida does uh, express a, a, uh, an appreciation of, of uh, uh, the Chinese language, for example, uh, as being, uh, he thinks, outside of logocentrism. In any case, at a conference in China, Derrida himself reportedly repeated, with a reference to Hegel's discourses on the Greek origins of philosophies, philosophy, the trope that China does not have any philosophy, only thought, Solomon uh, Pensé. The, his Chinese hosts were not happy uh, with this statement. To be sure, he went on to clarify to his disgruntled Chinese hosts that what he meant was that philosophy, uh, so this is Derrida now uh, speaking extemporaneously, philosophy is related to some sort of particular history, some languages and some ancient Greek invention. It is something of European form. In other words, like Heidegger, Derrida is not so much universalizing as he is particularizing Western philosophy. Nevertheless, in the only thought of his initial remark is unintentionally yet still ironically iterated the ignorance and arrogance of the ethnocentric metaphysics of logocentrism namely the idea that I can locate your discourse both within and beneath my own. In other words, I have a name for your less rigorous and culturally particular discourse, thought or pensée, but you have no name for my more rigorous and universal one, philosophy. philosophy. When judgments uh, are made concerning whether there was philosophy in pre-Meiji Japan or in other places and times, it is important to clarify what definition of philosophy is being explicitly or implicitly presupposed. The simple answer is that it tends to be Western philosophy, that is, philosophy as it has been conceived of and practiced in the Western tradition. But is there a univocal definition of philosophy in the Western tradition. In fact, the meanings and methods of philosophy have been discussed, disputed, and repeatedly redefined throughout the Western tradition from the ancient Greeks to recent proponents of the contending contemporary schools of analytic, pragmatist, continental, and other genres of philosophizing. Even within the continental camp, Heidegger, Deleuze, and, and Guattari and other philosophers continue to write books and articles on the question, what is philosophy? And as with other central questions of philosophy, there is little agreement among them regarding this basic meta-philosophical question. So the Western tradition itself is still debating the definition of philosophy. 
writing at the start of the 20th century in a treatise titled The Essence of Philosophy, Das Wesen der Philosophie, Diltai commented that the term philosophy or philosophical has so many meanings according to time and place that it can seem that the different times have attached to the fine word formulated by the Greeks, philosophy, onto always different intellectual images. Is there a unifying thread to all of Western philosophy, Diltai wonders, or is it the case that there are philosophies, but not philosophy? There is no system, but only various systems of philosophy, each, as he puts it, with a different content and compass. Indeed, even in ancient Greece, philosophy never had a univocal definition. The 5th century commentator Ammonius, in his attempt to synthesize Platonic and Aristotelian conceptions of the discipline, could whittle the definitions of philosophy down to no fewer than six. Knowledge of being uh, qua being, knowledge of what is divine and what is human, becoming like God, so far as this is possible for humans, to attend to death by way of enacting the separation of the soul from the body, the art of arts and the science of sciences, and the love of wisdom. Ammonius ends by saying, there are still other definitions of philosophy, but these will suffice. How many contemporary Western academic philosophers would still accept these definitions? In particular, the Platonic definitions of philosophy as a matter of becoming like God and practicing dying by separating the soul from the body would not be accepted by many, and not only because they would not accept the theology and anthropological dualism implied in Plato's account. The definition of philosophy as a rational inquiry into the eternal order of the cosmos, undertaken for its own sake, can be traced back to an Aristotelian conception of theoria, which some see as prefiguring the purportedly disinterested inquiry of modern theoretical science albeit this is a view of science that many philosophers of science would dispute. In a patently symptomatic iteration of a Eurocentric, or indeed what I call a Euromonopolistic, conception of philosophy that draws on the Aristotelian tradition of Theoria, a book polemically and flatly titled, But Not Philosophy, Seven Introductions to Non-Western Thought. Uh, George Anas uh, Anastoplo, a student of Leo Strauss, supports the claim that the European tradition that began in ancient Greece is superior to other traditions of thought, insofar as it alone discovered a universal order of nature as distinguished from custom or convention. In his critique of uh, Anastoplo's book, John Moraldo suggests that it should be seen in light of the greater project of University of Chicago scholars, who, in the wake of Alan, Alan Bloom, pursue an agenda to counter the expansion of the general education curriculum at American universities beyond the Western classics. So the, you know, kind of great culture wars of, of the uh, 80s and 90s, I guess, uh, about whether we should only study Western classics or whether we should also study non-Western uh, traditions. And so it should be seen in that, in that context of, of this group of University of Chicago scholars taking a firm stand on the keep keep the American curriculum uh, uh, exclusively Western. In any case, Moraldo continues, this challenge does help those interested in Japanese philosophy to raise and reflect on some important questions. So Moraldo, uh, uh, John Moraldo, is a, a, um, he's trained in both uh, Western philosophy dissertation in Germany, he wrote on, on Gadamer's hermeneutics, but he also lived in Japan, and he's a scholar of, of Japanese philosophy as well. So he writes, uh, Do we find in Japanese traditions evidence of inquiry pursued for its own sake, or hints of such a basis for theoretical science? Is there an explicit, consciously formed notion of nature as opposed to human convention? Are these features necessary conditions of philosophy proper, philosophy as it is traditionally delimited? It would seem to me that the alternatives, inquiry for the sake of spiritual transformation, for example, or theory necessarily informed by practice, or human cultivation as a part of nature, 
are not only instructive, but perhaps constitutive of a more developed definition of philosophy. In other words, allowing pre-Meiji Japanese thought into the field of philosophy may enrich our critical considerations not only of the specific, specific content, but also of the general framework within which such discussions take place. It may also help recover from the myopia that results from an exclusive immersion in contemporary Western academic views of philosophy, so that we can take so that we can not only take into account non-Western ways of philosophizing, but also recover ancient Western views, as Pierre Adol and others have um, attempted to do. Among these noteworthy others is one of our plenary speakers uh, for later in this conference, uh, Peter Adamson, whose podcast and, and project, History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps, has not only reminded and informed us about the massive Islamic as well as Jewish influence on the development of medieval Western philosophy, but is also now awakening us to the riches of Africana and indigenous, as well as Asian traditions of philosophy. In response to the, uh, this is my, my concluding section now, uh, just a couple of slides, I think. In response to the reactionary cultural retrenchment in the United States in the 1980s and 90s, revolving around the question of diversifying our college curriculums, uh, Martha Nussbaum argued against the conservative cr critics of multicultural education, such as Alan Bloom, uh, who ignorantly asserted, Alan Bloom did, that, quote, only in the Western nations, i.e. those influenced by Greek philosophy, is there some willingness to doubt the identification of the good with one's own way, uh, end quote. In fact, this claim is not just ironic, but indeed oxymoronic, in that by identifying the good capacity for self-critique exclusively with the Western tradition, Bloom demonstrates precisely the close-minded conceit he attributes to others. Nussbaum, herself uh, probably a more renowned Western classicist than Bloom, recognizes, this is Nussbaum now, quote, one of the errors that a diverse education can dispel is the false belief that one's own tradition is the only one that is capable of self-criticism or universal aspiration, end quote. Certainly Asian philosophical traditions, among others, supply ample evidence of this. Decisions regarding the bestowal of the honorific monikers, philosophy and philosopher, seem to have more to do with the cultural chauvinism and, and the politics of academia than they do with the rigor of reasons. Just as the acceptance of continental thought in the English-speaking world has, for the most part, taken place outside of philosophy departments for reasons that have to do with the way in which one particular tradition has tended to monopolize the way that the methods and canon of philosophy are defined vis-a-vis -vis other academic disciplines. The treatment of non-Western philosophical traditions has often been relegated to a field of area studies, such as Asian studies, or to religious studies, or comparative literature. Those who engage in the study and development of Japanese or other non-Western philosophies should respond to this situation, as Simon Critchley does on behalf of continental philosophy, by calling for a robust philosophical pluralism that recognizes, as Critchley puts it, that philosophy has more than one tradition and that assertions of philosophical exclusi exclusivism result at best in parochialism and at worst in intellectual imperialism. The only way we can avoid such parochial and imperialistic assertions of philosophical Euro-monopolism, I maintain, is if we allow other ways of thinking to contribute to a multilateral as well as multilingual dialogue on the methods and aims as well as the content of philosophy. This, I suggest, is how we can best navigate between the horns of the dilemma of inclusionary versus exclusionary violence in the field of philosophy, a field which is finally, belatedly, and still ambivalently, 
not only including, but perhaps even slowly becoming synonymous with the field of cross-cultural philosophy. Perhaps the day is coming when it is no longer Western philosophy, but rather cross-cultural philosophy that will be understood as a tautology. Thank you very much. All right. We thank you uh, for your uh, this brilliant uh, presentations. We will receive questions and uh, comments on what you have talked about after uh, Professor uh, Len Gutmann's uh, presentations. Is that okay for you? That's fine, sure. All right, all right. Now our next speaker is uh, Len, uh, Professor Len Goodman. Uh, again, let me give a brief information about him and about his works. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Len Goodman is a professor of philosophy, Andrew Mellon professor in the humanities at Vanderbilt uh, University. Len Goodman has written many essays, encyclopedia uh, entries, and books, edited journals, and collections on most of the major figures of Muslim and J Jewish philosophy. He is the winner of the American Philosophical Association Baumgart uh, Memorial Prize and was a rare humanities recipient of Vanderbilt uh, University's top research award the Earl Sunderland Prize, Prize. In 2008, Oxford University Press published Goodman's Gifford Lectures under the title Love Thy Neighbor as Thyself. Professor Goodman uh, uh, this evening, or again today, will talk about uh, on the heritage of Islamic humanism uh, through tackling uh, humanistic dams Dims in the words of Al Kindi, Al Razi, Al Farabi, Ikhwan Al Safa, and Ms. Kewey. Yes, please, you may start, Professor Goodman. Thank you so much, and thank you, please, uh, very much appreciative uh, of the effort of the organizers in putting together this international meeting, and I hope that there will be many more like it. Uh, I want to uh, express my uh, profound appreciation to a, uh, a thinker who has a deep heritage at Ege University, uh, Ahmed Arslan, who translated my book, uh, Islamic Humanism, into the Turkish language. Uh, that yeah. was uh, uh, very meaningful to me because there were two objectives to that work. One is to uh, seek to overcome the rather narrow and uh, violent image of Islamic culture that has been propagated uh, in the media and exacerbated by the actions of uh, uh, violent individuals. Uh, but also I wanted that book to help awaken um, uh, thinkers and students and the general public uh, in the Middle East and North Africa to the uh, humanistic riches of their own tradition and the, uh, and the figures in that tradition who have contributed so largely um, to the conceptual and moral and political uh, uh, richness and depth of uh, philosophical thinking. Uh, I wanted, I wanted uh, the self-image of uh, those readers who come from the uh, Islamic tradition or in co close contact with it, uh, to be appreciative of um, the richness of their own tradition and to build upon that richness. I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to say that I have uh, two students uh, currently, one from Morocco and one from Turkey, from Izmir in fact, who have uh, taken it upon themselves to uh, contribute to the continuation of that rich humanistic uh, tradition uh, I, I think about a remark that Muhammad Arkun made uh, in writing about uh, the importance of the humanistic side of the Islamic tradition. Uh, he, he spoke about the need for thinkers today to participate in the formation of humanism in societies that are today ransacked, as he put it, by forces that oppose 
both the human being and humanity. The building of such a humanism, he adds, is equally a goal of all religions known until now to develop the most humane parts of the human being in order to protect humanity from the penchant for violence, which is so marring to human history uh, over the long term. Arkun speaks out for the relevance of cosmopolitanism to the opening up of that humanistic strand. Oh, we, uh, we need to know each other. We need to be aware of each other's depth, of each other's moral character, of each other's uh, intellectual uh, seriousness uh, and aesthetic and moral uh, seriousness to, uh, uh, to really attain the kind of conversation that humanizes humanity. Um, yes, as you mentioned, I, uh, I would start out, I, I have a few examples here, uh, exemplary figures that represent that humanistic tradition. And uh, were there much more time, there would be much more to say. Uh, but a sampling here, uh, starting with uh, Al-Kindi, died in 866 or 67, uh, known as the philosopher of the Arabs. Uh, interesting epithet there because uh, he was uh, among, among those philosophers who wrote in Arabic. Many of them, like Al-Farabi, came from Turkic origin and uh, Avicenna came from Iran. Uh, uh, many of them were not ethnic Arabs, Al-Kindi was, uh, but uh, his philosophical inquiries led him beyond uh, uh, his Arab roots. Uh, he was interested in Greek philosophy and learned from it immensely. Uh, he was a physician, a musical theorist. Uh, uh, his, his studies led him to uh, appreciate and profit from uh, traditions that were foreign to uh, those of his contemporaries, and he wanted to enlighten them about that. Uh, in his essay on first philosophy, uh, he quoted uh, Aristotle on the gratitude that we owe to anyone who contributes, even in the smallest way, to our grasp of the truth. Even if those persons themselves did not possess it fully. In other words, they don't have to be members of our own tradition. We don't have to give up our own tradition in order to learn from them. Uh, he condemns those, as he put it, who traffic in religion, although he says, condemning them, devoid of it themselves, whose envious and power hungry souls lead them to condemn such openness. Kindi was himself under pressure from such individuals, and in his late years, when the political tides turned, he, uh, he suffered uh, as a result of persecution from those who opposed that kind of open-mindedness. You can get a good example of uh, Kindi's putting to use that kind of open-mindedness when he takes a text from the Quran and reads it uh, in a uh, Mutazilite fashion, uh, he's, he's open to learn from the Mutazilite. He's not a Mutakalim himself. He's not a practitioner of Islamic uh, dialectical theology, but he learned from their glass gloss of the Quran. Uh, the Quran in Surah 55 verses 5 and 6 uh, refers to the prostration of the stars before God. In his essay on that passage, uh, the prostration of the outermost sphere and its obedience to God, uh, which is uh, published by Abu Rida in his collection of the Rasail. Uh, he points out, Kindi points out, that many Arabic words have multiple meanings. And even some, as we know who study Arabic, uh, some words uh, have a valence that goes in two different directions. They can mean uh, something positive and something negative at the same time. Sujud, the prostration or bowing down that that verse refers to uh, can signify prostration or kneeling or pressing the hands to the ground. But it is also a term, Kindi writes, for obedience uh, without actual physical bowing down and pressing the hands, kneeling or pressing the palms. Uh, he cites pre-Islamic poetry to prove the uh, correct source of that, uh, of that word uh, using the technique of the early Arabic lexicographers to establish that um, 
when when the panegyric of the pre-Islamic poet suggests that various uh, powers uh, bow down to uh, the man he is praising, it doesn't mean they literally bow to him. They stay right where they were, but they uh, uh, defer and respect and accept his authority. So Kindi takes that line from the Quran and uses it as a proof text to show that nature uh, accepts the rule of God through the role and the rule of natural God of natural law uh, imposed by God. Uh, so he's turning he's turning that Quranic phrase into a uh, a piece of evidence in behalf of the philosophical view of the world and the natural law that governs cosmology, uh, citing uh, pre-Islamic poetry, relying on uh, Aristotelian views about the laws of nature and subsequent views about the laws of nature, and uh, open-minded about the Mu'tazilites, even though their methods of philosophical argument are quite different from his own. Kindi, creatively and boldly, uh, affirms the uh, creation of the world. Uh, in Aristotelian thinking, you have four basic kinds of change, uh, motion and increasing and diminution, and uh, uh, we all know the four kinds of change. Uh, Kindy boldly adds a fifth kind, which he calls the production of Isa min Lysa, of is from is not. Uh, he is, adheres to the scriptural idea of creation, uh, and he's not intimidated by the authority of Aristotle. Aristotle may be a great philosopher, and he accepts Aristotle's view that we should learn from all sources of truth, but he does not accept the Aristotelian view that the possibility of something coming from nothing is uh, uh, ruled out or absurd. My second exemplar of open-mindedness, of thinking, of humanistic tradition among Islamic philosophers is Muhammad of Zakaria Razi, great physician whose medical works survived uh, right down into uh, the Renaissance in Europe and Latin translation. Razi was a great believer in independent thinking, uh, so much so that uh, when challenged by a, a Shiite spokesman uh, uh, about the need for leaders and led, and we have to uh, follow because not everybody can think for himself, Razi disagrees. Razi thinks that everybody can think for himself. And when that Shiite uses uh, a, an ancient uh, argument uh, whose roots are Stoic, uh, that uh, you know, the Stoics argued that gods have to tell us what they expect of us if they are uh, uh, going to hold us accountable for our actions. Uh, and therefore, the Stoics argued, you can read about this in Cicero's De Natura Deorum, therefore the Stoics argued uh, they must communicate with us through auguries. That argument was taken over by Mu'tazilites and picked up by Shiites. Uh, to show that the uh, that that God has a kind of moral obligation as a responsible being to inform us of His desires uh, and intentions, uh, and um, so so He gets a dialectical challenge. Razi does. Uh, Don't you think that God has to communicate with us? And Razi says, I think God does communicate with us, but He does so not through the vehicles of special revelation. He does so through the, uh, the human mind. That's where the real revelation comes. Special revelation is the work of imposters. And if they're inspired at all, it's demonically because their special claims that they and their followers exclusively have the revelation of God lead only to bloodshed uh, of a sort, which in Razi's time and long since has been a, a uh, a, a deep stain on the tradition of uh, religious anti-pluralism, shall we say. Uh, he, sees, he sees the claims of special revelation as a source of, um, as a source of inter and intercommunal uh, torment 
warfare, bloodshed. Notice, notice Razi's interesting claim uh, that everybody in some kind of democratic way uh, has the ability to think for himself or herself. And his further eschatological claim that uh, people can, uh, uh, that if they think for themselves even a little bit, that will open the doors to them to immortality. It doesn't happen by way of faith. It doesn't happen by way of election. It happens by way of thinking, which everyone is capable of. And those who don't do it have only themselves to blame. They haven't been as interested as they should be in the long, long important uh, question of their, own, of their own personal development and their own ultimate fate. Uh, I mentioned the Ikhwana Safa. The Ikhwana Safa uh, are the authors of, as you know, 52 Rasail. I interpret Rasail not as epistles, but as essays, because the essay form originates with the uh, letter form. Uh, it is informal compared to a treatise. It is uh, informally organized. It is very associative. It is very digressive. Uh, but one of the characteristics of the intimate uh, of the of the essay form is the intimacy with which an author addresses his reader, and the Ikhwana Safa do that repeatedly, calling upon their reader to follow them, to pay attention, to listen, to uh, to do that thinking and reflection, which uh, which they think uh, is is so vital to uh, human uh, intellect and to human life. Uh, I was privileged, along with my colleague Richard McGregor, to translate uh, the one Risala, which is the most famous, the most popular, also the most fun, which was why it was the most popular, the, uh, the one which they themselves titled The Case of the Animals versus Man. In other Risala, uh, the Ikhwana Safa, the sincere brethren of Basra, uh, engage in uh, a kind of expository writing. They tell you about animals uh, in the same way that they tell you about plants or the stars or arithmetic uh, or politics. But in this one, they seem to have thought it was relevant to give a speaking part to the animals themselves. And they pick up for the first time in Arabic literature, the option of um, having animals actually speak at some length. Uh, taking taking their uh, their case before the king of the jinn uh, for the claim that human beings mistreat animals. Uh, they not only eat them, but they abuse them. They swear at them. They uh, they beat them. Uh, various complaints are made. And if you haven't read that wonderful risala, I recommend that you do so. Uh, we have the critical Arabic text uh, published side by side with our English translation and commentary uh, in, that, in that volume. Uh, the, the king of the jinn is in charge of hearing the case because he is neither human nor an animal. Jinn, as you know, are composed of fire rather than water, earth, and air. And the fable is Aesopian in a couple of interesting cases. Uh, it gives the lie to the uh, postmodern notion that human beings are unable to think outside the box that they live in, the cultural box, the, the uh, socio-cultural frame that, uh, that they've been brought up in and the language that they use and so forth. Because here, uh, by taking the perspective of the animals, uh, the Ikhwana Safar are able to critique all kinds of human pretensions and human institutions. They're not terribly loyal to the existing Abbasid authority. They are Shiites themselves, and uh, they concealed their identity uh, in uh, by calling themselves the, the sincere brethren or the pure or the pure brethren. Uh, their identity was in fact learned by Tawhidi, who uh, circulated enough that I think he knew all the gossip that was going in his time. But uh, and uh, that text by Tawhidi was was discovered uh, by one teacher of mine, uh, just as my teacher, uh, Richard Valser, worked so well on that uh, uh, work of Kindy's, 
uh, the uh, Samuel Stern, uh, he knew, he found out from reading Tawhidi, the names of the people who were the Ikhwan Safa, the secret committee who wrote this work. Uh, but it um, doesn't matter a great deal. Their names by themselves don't mean all that much to us. But their Aesopian fable means, means a, a great deal because of that stance they take outside the society they live in, using the perspective of the animals to critique that society and human pretensions in general, uh, to take humanity down a peg uh, on all kinds of claims that we're very proud of, about our rationality, about our, uh, about our institutions, uh, about our arts and sciences. Um, the uh, Ikhwana Safa have a sense of the human mission. And they think of that mission partly in Islamic and partly in Platonic terms. They have a kind of synthesis fusing those two. And they have uh, an interesting version of cosmopolitanism. I call it an interesting version because in part, we could see it as a, uh, uh, like, like Arabic universal historiography, which I've also written about. In part, it's an expression of the uh, multicultural existential situation that Muslims found themselves in, uh, in, the, uh, in the era, in, in the wake of the uh, Islamic uh, imperialistic conquests. Uh, but, but like the Russian interests in the East and other, uh, uh, other uh, well, uh, Vimruni's interest in India, uh, they weren't just trying to, uh, the Ahwana Safa weren't particularly engaged in that kind of conquest, but they were very interested in knowing the multiplicity and the diversity of the societies that the Islamic empire had brought them in contact with. They were interested in religious and ethnic diversity. They were interested in the diversity of ideas and races. And they carried that further into an interest in the diversity of animal species. They'll, they'll say, for example, uh, you humans think that you're the best looking animals, but, but uh, appearances are only a matter of what would attract a mate to, uh, to a different species. Uh, a different form and configuration would be more attractive than yours. Uh, again, using their perspective, uh, which they learned from the uh, Patanjali, uh, from from the uh, from the Indian fables, which were translated into uh, Middle Persian and into Persian and into Arabic, the tales of Khalila and, Dinj and, and Dimna. Uh, they learned how that the the animals could do this kind of Aesopian work, uh, criticizing institutions and pretensions. And, uh, and they put that very much to work in behalf of their cosmopolitanism, which feeds their humanism. Interesting that authors who are critical of humanity should use that critique as a moral and spiritual wedge and lever to try to advance a, uh, 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 an idea of what humanity can be instead of just a pride in what humanity has been. Uh, my, my final thinker as I'm beginning to uh, uh, come to an end would be Miskawaih. Miskawaih lived a uh, hundred years in the Islamic calendar, 930 to 1030 uh, in, the, uh, in the Western calendar. Uh, maybe, maybe he's born a little bit later, um, but a hundred years Islamic years are 3% shorter than uh, uh, solar years. And uh, he's a historian, a philosopher, a courtier, a physician, a librarian, a connoisseur of poetry. Uh, one of the things that Miskalek did, which I think is terribly important in the history of philosophy, is, uh, is to naturalize and, and bring into the Arabic uh, linguistic domain, uh, the idea of virtue ethics, which was part of the work of Aristotle. I have to say, uh, I, I think that uh, even some of Aristotle's biological ideas remain of interest. It's Aristotle, after all, who tells us what an organism is uh, and, and how the parts of an organism serve uh, functions. Uh, that's, 
that's a that's an idea that remains, uh, even though we no longer hold uh, Aristotelian ideas that species don't change and uh, his his notion that evolution would somehow be a, a violation of the law of logic. But uh, virtue ethics is a lasting contribution of Aristotle's. Uh, the roots, like in much of Aristotle's thinking, the roots of it are there in Plato. But Aristotle made a system out of it, just as he made a system out of Plato's explorations and excursions into logic. Uh, we can't say that Plato invented scientific logic, but Aristotle did. And in the case of um, Avicenna, we know that Avicenna can adopt and adapt and expand and enlarge the Aristotelian approach to logic and enrich it still further, just as al uh took up Greek mathematics and Hindu mathematics and carried them much, much further uh, in the Islamic environment. Miskawaih learned how to do um, virtue ethics, it seems, from, uh, from the Christian uh, theologian. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, interesting episode in uh, the fruits of cross-culturalism because, because uh, virtue ethics comes from Aristotle, is adapted in the Arabic language by a Christian theologian from Tikrit, one of the good contributions from Tikrit. Uh, it, it wasn't just uh, the, the hometown of Saddam Hussein. And picked up by Miskawaih and used by him uh, and then from Miskawaih by Al-Ghazali. And through Al-Ghazali, uh, very broadly accepted uh, as though, as, as, if, as if the concept of virtue ethics were, were something uh, that one is just born with, but it wasn't a, a, a natural thing. It was an invented idea picked up from those sources by Maimonides and Maimonides is able to read the entire 613 commandments of the Mosaic Torah as uh, all aiming to enhance humanity's moral and intellectual virtues. He can interpret the entire Torah that way, uh, not just as a series of positive commands, uh, books on it, camel's back in the Nietzschean image, but, but things that are designed to enhance and perfect our humanity our humanity to enable us to achieve that perfection of which we are capable to realize our perfection as human beings. Miskawaih is uh, a, a great contributor to Islamic civilization. And part of that contribution rests upon his intellectual philosophical openness. He reads poetry. He thinks about Plato's reflections on, uh, on um, what would be fair and effective systems of taxation. Um, and he was an active politician, so he was able to put that into, a pra into practice very effectively. There's a wonderful ex ex a point of Miskawais, uh cosmopolitanism and humanism when uh, he addresses questions about alchemy. And alchemy, uh, was, I, I think you all know, it wasn't just a matter of turning base metals into gold. It was a matter of transforming things, uh, one substance into another. It's ancestral, as Primo Levi showed, to uh, chemistry. Uh, and uh, that kind of transformation was in a very, very primitive stage at the time. But people were already alarmed about it. What if, what if somebody uh, with bad intentions, got a hold of those techniques and learned, if you, if you want to fast forward into the present time, learned how to uh, change one element into another, learned how to, how to do nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Uh, that, would be, that would be alchemy in the 20th and 21st century uh, mode. And uh, the challenge Miskawaih faced was the question, uh, what if somebody used that power 
to, uh, to, to, to do destructive things. And Meskowitz said a thing which I think was uh, expressive of the, uh, of the deep humanism that he held. He said, well, in order to learn how to do that kind of thing, one would first have to have a very broad and deep philosophical education, an education, as we might put it, in the humanities. And if you had that kind of education, you would have the humane values that go with it, and you would not be tempted to abuse the power that you had over transforming one substance into another. That's an expression of humanistic faith. And I would only end with the hope that, uh, uh, that he was right, uh, moderated and mitigated by the fear that not everybody who supposedly knows of the humanities or who has learned enough chemistry to be able to master the humanities, I would end with the hope that uh, that Miskawai, uh, the Miskawai's premise or or expectation that that someone uh, would have learned sufficient humane values uh, in the course of mastering physics and chemistry, that uh, that he would not be tempted to use those powers destructively. I fear, I fear very much that there are some places where that hope might not be realized, but we can still hope. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you're muted. I can't hear you. I, I can't hear you. Oh, now you, you must hear me now. Yes, now I can hear you. Yeah, all right, all right. Thank you very much, Professor Len Gutman, for this nice talk. Now we are going to have some uh, questions and comments on what you have spoken. Right. Sure. Uh, now I I will read the questions or comments from from the screen. Uh, uh, first question is from Maya Mandalinji. Uh, to uh, Professor Davis, and she says, uh, uh, Professor Davis, thank you for the wonderful speech. Yes, you are there, uh, Professor Davis. Uh, although the definition of philosophy varies, it, se it still seems that the beginning with the tales, switching from mythos to log logos, becomes important as a ge genesis which is at best speculative, if not pretty wrong. So leaning on this beginning, Western philosophy not only abstained from including Eastern ideas, but more problematically, it itself imposes its own philosophical definition or criteria in a way that will be exclusive. This then seems to be circular. Is there an escape from it as a vicious circle. Is it possible to think about it as a hermeneutic one, maybe as rebuilding it on the way by being open to new ideas? This is the question. Or questions. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely clear on the, um, the vicious circle. Uh, aspect of the question. Vicious um, circle, exactly. It's vicious circle. It's right. Vicious circle. Maybe I don't I mean, know. But, yeah, Maybe we, we, we may ask uh, uh, Maya herself, Maya Mandalinji. Uh, I mean, I can I can maybe respond more generally. Maybe to they. The Maybe she may rewrite his question. Let's move to another question or another uh, 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 writing. Another one is to Professor Gutman. And here is the question. It, is the, it says, uh, why did you call your uh, 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 book name as Islamic humanism. Good question. Thank right. you. Uh, who who asked the question? 
Ayşe. She is Ayşe. 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 Thank yes. You. Or, Thank yes. you for that question. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, I had I had two objectives in that book. Uh, one was to show a side of the Islamic intellectual tradition, both philosophical and beyond the philosophical, uh, literary and and historiographic and otherwise, uh, to show that heritage to people in the West whose ideas of Islam were narrow and skewed, be, partly because of the bad actions of bad actors and partly because of the excessive attention to those bad actions uh, uh, by, uh, by the media, uh, which, which have uh, ignored the more positive uh, dimensions of Islamicate civilization. I use that adjective Islamicate, meaning uh, the Islamic uh, uh, empire included uh, multiple uh, cultural and ethnic traditions, religious traditions, and so forth uh, under its aegis, uh, sometimes happily, sometimes unhappily, but, uh, but, but uh, that was an important pluralistic system, uh, and, and we need to know uh, more about it. Um, uh, I wanted, secondarily, to, uh, to let Muslims themselves know uh, about the richness of their heritage, uh, which has been uh, misunderstood and misrepresented by, uh, by loud voices. You know, there's a saying in English that the squeaky wheel is the one that gets oiled. And um, uh, in this case, um, we, we know about uh, some of the angry voices who profess to be the voices of Islamic and Islamic hate civilization. Uh, we need to know more uh, uh, both within that world and beyond it about the, um, about the richer voices. Let me tell you what I mean by humanism uh, in that context. I mean, I mean a valuation of human beings as individuals in their cultural diversity and all their identity. Uh, a value of their potential to grow and develop, to learn and understand, to appreciate with, with one another. And one of my theses uh, that, I, that I stated in, in the little talk today uh, is that um, uh, cosmopolitanism is both a dimension of humanism and a, uh, 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 and, and a means to its achievement. Uh, you, you can't run your car without gas, and you can't uh, get gas in the car unless you have an opening in which to pump the gas, so petrol. So, so uh, uh, those, that openness, which is uh, spoken for by cosmopolitanism, by seeing oneself as a citizen of the world, as a participant in a larger international and interconfessional and interlinguistic uh, uh, culture, that's a very important heritage. Uh, the term cosmopolitan comes to us from the Stoics, who gave it a, a, a positive spin. Uh, originally, originally uh, as the cynics coined the term, uh, it meant, it meant uh, uh, having no loyalty to one's own culture and place, but only to uh, the larger world. But the Stoics gave it a more positive intention, which is, which is that one has a loyalty all the way down, both to one's own background and heritage and to the larger humanistic world, the larger human world. Uh, and uh, uh, that's part of what I had in mind when I spoke about Islamic humanism. I want people to be aware that that tradition is there. Uh, it's there in Kindi and uh, Al-Farabi. I, I didn't speak about Al-Farabi today, but I, but I could if you wish me to. Uh, Al-Farabi Al uh, analyzing the, uh, uh, the, the De Interpretatione of uh, Perihomenius of Aristotle deals with the question of determinism. And he has a brilliant logical solution to the, uh, to the problem of um, the sea battle, the interpretatione nine. 
And his solution rests on his strength as a logician, which is something he learns how to do from reading Greek sources in translation. But it's motivated by his desire to overcome his contemporaries in the nascent Ashoet movement, who are believing that everything is determined uh, and, and you don't have any control, uh, uh, you don't create your own actions, as al Ashari put it. Uh, that, that, he says, is a view which is very, very dangerous. Those are his words, very, very harmful to, uh, to all human beings. So his, his skills are analytic. His motives are humanistic. Mm -hmm. That's a yeah, that's a good example uh, of what I mean. Was that was that helpful? I suppose so. All right, let's move to the next question. And the next question is going to the both speakers. May, may I may I respond to the first question? Because I, I all right, I, all right, it was, yeah, a, it was a good question, and it was a all good right. question, and I, I I feel badly for the person who who posed it. Uh, because yeah. I, I wanted to get clearer on the, start with the word vicious. Yeah, I wanted to get clearer on on um, what was meant by that term. But the general question, I think, is a very good question, and so let me respond to it. Um, and then, if if there's a follow up question about the the vicious circle, then that's that's fine too. But I understand the general question to be uh, the the typical way in which we. Um, teach philosophy, the way in which we learn and teach philosophy, um, certainly the way I, I learned it, the way I teach it now, and, and I teach an introduction to the to Western philosophy uh, course as well, um, is often to uh, to focus on this um, transition from, from mythos to logos. And I think that is a very uh, important and, and, and powerful um, hermeneutic uh, to look at, at, at what happened. And so, for example, in in my introduction to, to Western philosophy course, uh, I used that hermeneutics to start with uh, by looking at, at uh, Homer and Hesiod uh, and uh, the appeal to the muses uh, as the origin of, uh, of mythos, the kind of mythical accounts, we might say, of reality, inspired you know, by the muses, to something that happens with, with the, the pre-Socratics, uh, you know, starting, of course, on the coast of, of Turkey, with today's Turkey, um, with with trying to give uh, rational accounts, the kind of uh, you know proto scientific accounts of uh, uh, so you know roughly speaking using logos, appealing to both evidence and and reason. Uh, and so I think it's a very powerful hermeneutic to introduce. You know what are we doing in philosophy? We're not simply appealing to to tradition and to authority and to uh, the narrative accounts, but we're trying to um, do as Kant says, and to dare to think for ourselves and use reason and appeal to evidence. Uh, so it's important, I think, to sort of convey that to students. But then, as you move forward, uh, very soon in the Western tradition, it becomes very much more complicated. Uh, so for example, in, in Socrates and, and Plato in general, the relation between mythos and logos is much more complicated than simply uh, uh, leaving mythos in the in the past and now uh, adopting a stance of uh, of logos, and you can see, for example, um, sorry, in the early Platonic dialogues, Socrates, uh, you know, especially if you look at, for example, the the Phaedo, Socrates appeals to mythos, right? And now he's he's going to, when he wants to talk about the more the most important things, death especially, the afterlife especially. He's uh, willing to draw on traditional tales, as he puts it, the mythoi, uh, and yet he's going to do it in a different way. Now he's going to, to, as he says, tell and examine tales. So this combination of mythos and logos, I think, sets the, the pattern for much of the Western tradition. And if you move from there to uh, when the, the biblical traditions are brought in, uh, with figures like Augustine, you very much see that the whole question of faith and reason, the whole question of appealing to um, to texts and, and traditions, uh, and also uh, you know uh, um, uh, rationally uh, uh, thinking about them, continues this this interplay 
between mythos and logos. And so it's not simply a narrative. Uh, Western philosophy is not simply a narrative of leaving mythos behind and now now we're doing uh, logos, as it were. So that's the first part of, of my response. The second response is whether we can, what happens when we, we try to look at other traditions? And is it a useful hermeneutic, uh, the transition from mythos to logos? is uh, To what extent is that a useful hermeneutic uh, for looking at other traditions? And I think that's one way to do it, uh, to do cross-cultural philosophy. We should realize when we do that, that that's what we're doing. We're taking a Western hermeneutic and we're going to then uh, apply it and see how well uh, it, it works and helps us understand other traditions. So we need to be aware that we are applying a Western hermeneutic. But nevertheless, if we do that, I think it can be very fruitful. Uh, for example, if you look at the Hindu tradition, the Indian tradition, uh, it starts with very kind of uh, mythological accounts, right? The early Vedas. And, and then the Upanishads are sort of trans, uh, they're, um, transitional text in this regard uh, because they become more, more philosophical. But then it's only in the, the, uh, you know, the, the philosophical schools of Hinduism that it becomes uh, quite f recognizably philosophical. They're doing things that are recognizably epistemological, logical, uh, and so forth, uh, and you get you know things like the three Vedanta schools, which are are uh, are again going between mythos and logos. You could say they're all Vedanta means the end of the Vedas, which means the the Upanishads. So they're all drawing on the Upanishads as kind of their authoritative textual sources, but they're very much using uh, using reason and interpreting those sources in very different ways. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I would say not unlike you have, for example, in uh, in the Christian tradition or in the Islamic tradition, where you have really, um, you know, original thinkers uh, reading texts in, in, in different ways, uh, in part as, as Professor Goodman was just talking about. Uh, briefly, if we turn to China, things are more interesting, I think, because early on in China, there's there's both kind of this move from something like mythos to logos, but there's also a, a suspicion early on in, in China, uh, a suspicion that um, goes directly against, say, Parmenides, this uh, claim that what is there for thinking is there for, for being. Uh, or, you know, as Hegel will m many centuries later say, the real is the rational and the rational is the real. Uh, and the early Chinese thinkers, doubt, many of them, doubt that. They doubt whether logos, uh, meaning more generally uh, language, but also specifically logical um, discourse, really uh, maps on perfectly to reality. In other words, they worry about this gap between uh, the map, logos, and the territory, um, reality. Um, and uh, a very different philosophical tradition develops when it begins with a kind of uh, a skeptical position about that um, that match between human logos uh, and um, uh, and the patterns of reality, uh, as it were. Uh, so I'll stop. I'll stop there on that question. All right. Okay. Uh, let's move to the, another uh, question, which is which goes to the both speakers uh, from Gwen Gzeldere. Uh, and by the way, uh, I say is uh, I said is thanking to you, Professor Goodman, for your you know, uh, your, for your answer. Uh, Gwen Gisele Dere uh, now he says, in, refer, in reference to Professor Mehmet Kuyurta's opening remarks, I want to ask both speakers uh, what they think about the ongoing debate about the history of philosophy status vis-a-vis -vis the text that they study in uh, the respective traditions of their expertise. For example, the East Asian and the Islamic traditions should be considered, he says, and interpret uh, historical figures in philosophy as contemporary interlo interlocutors trying to bring their thought into the contemporary discussions or treat them primarily in an antiquarian fashion as Dan Garber suggests. In other words, 
is this question about the status of history of philosophy to be adju adjudicated uh, differently in the Western versus the non-Western traditions of thought and why? I'd be glad to take a stab at it. Uh, Brett, do you want to go first or? Uh... Uh, I'd, I'd prefer you go first because I think you might have a better handle on the question. <laughs> I'm, I, it's something I live with all the time, and and uh, and besides, you have the advantage. If I say something stupid, you can shoot shoot me down. Uh, the uh, I say I live with, with this all the time because I do teach philosophy, and I teach philosophy in several different traditions. Uh, I spent many years at the University of Hawaii, where comparative philosophy is uh, uh, meat and bread. Uh, for the faculty there. Uh, my specialty was Jewish and Islamic philosophy, uh, but uh, everybody in a normal sized philosophy department has to be uh, a multiple uh, person. Uh, you could see that in, in Brett's uh, situation. He's teaching intro as well as uh, his own specialties, uh, and he has several specialties. Um, if you think that all the problems of philosophy have been solved, and we heard a little of that attitude uh, reflected in, in the remarks of, of the introduction that we had, a uh, wonderful introduction, uh, the positivist thought that you know all the problems of philosophy have been solved because uh, they were all just based on linguistic confusions and, and uh, there, were, there were a few interesting problems. Uh, that, you, you reach a stage in the history of philosophy where um, certainly by the beginning of the present century, you'd, you'd have a tough time finding anybody who admitted publicly to being a logical positivist. And uh, there's a reason for that. One reason is that the uh, logical positivists thought that uh, a statement was meaningless unless it could be uh, verified uh, by sense perception or or reduced to a tautology by mathematical logical means. Um, well, that that restriction itself trips over its own feet. It fails by its own standard. It is, it is neither empirically verifiable nor logically reducible to tautology. It is it is at best uh, an admonition about what the right thing to do is, and thus part of what you might call epistemological morality. Uh, <laughs> you're not in a good place to dismiss morality if you're going to be practicing it. Uh, the, the, uh, the reason I like students to read philosophical texts from various traditions and in various voices and modes, and, and yes, uh, Brett was right about the different uh, uh, you know, in, in, in Japanese philosophy, the, the koan is a vehicle of philosophy. It, it's it, in, in, in biblical thinking, uh, a play on words can be a, a vehicle of philosophy. You don't, you don't have just one way of doing philosophy. Maimonides, whose guide to the perplexed I have just completed translating and commenting on, says, uh, you know, people have trouble finding the philosophy in scripture because scripture speaks in a revelatory manner uh, and they're only used to arguments being laid out step by step. We have to uh, translate and, and uh, expand and, and figure out what the arguments really are, are meant to be if we're going to put them into a different idiom that's more compatible with the way we expect. When I teach philosophy, I want the students to read that stuff not just for antiquarian reasons. Uh, I think that the people who do read it for antiquarian reasons are providing a very valuable service because they can get it right. They can help us to understand what was intended in its original context at its original time in its original cultural situation. Uh, so, so I value their work, but the next step for a philosopher is to try to think what we make of it. Can we learn from this? Uh, I'm teaching a Plato seminar right now. Uh, I don't teach Plato. He doesn't have a thing to learn from me. There are some books which try to show where Plato went wrong. Uh, that doesn't help Plato at all, and it doesn't help us very much. What we want to learn if we're reading Plato or Aristotle 
or any of those great thinkers from the past, Avicenna, Ibn Khaldun, Al-Farabi. We want to learn where the bodies are buried, how to do philosophy, how to make our moves, where not to trip over some exposed and ex you know, relic of uh, a misunderstanding. Uh, we want to read in order to become better philosophers of, our, uh, of, our, of ourselves. Uh, to, uh, to learn how to do philosophy, to carry philosophy further, because not all the questions have been solved. Uh, I, I, I'm getting to the end of the Plato seminar now. Uh, our semester will soon be ending. And uh, so I'll be teaching the Timaeus next week after Thanksgiving break. And uh, there are fascinating questions in the Timaeus about the question of how does God relate to nature. I know if you think that there's no sense talking about God, uh, you can bracket that question and just set it aside. But an awful lot of people do think about God and they want to know how does God relate to nature? God is supposed to be transcendent and nature is supposed to be here and now. Plato has some proposals in the Timaeus about how to do that. And there are numerous interpretive issues about how Plato pulled that off. And to pick up on what Brett was saying, uh, it's partly a matter of mythos and it's partly a matter of logos. Uh, uh, Plato likes to use myth, uh, both because he's a creative, poetic philosopher and because uh, sometimes it's his way of punting. He can, he can uh, uh, if he can't quite do it by way of logos, maybe he has an inspiration that can give it to him, give him a way of expressing a notion by way of mythos. Uh, we want to try and unpack that. And one of the things that I've seen uh, is that medieval thinkers and late Hellenistic and late, late ancient thinkers spend a lot of trouble uh, trying to put to work what Plato did in addressing that question and the related question what is the nature of matter? Uh, I, uh, I think that Plato struggling with that sort of question opens up issues for us. Uh, put God aside a minute and think about the question about nature in general and about matter, but specifically. And ideas, ideas about matters have, matter has, have changed vastly over the past few decades. Uh, and uh, there is no consensus about what to say about matter. Uh, and and uh, is it, what, what does mathematics tell us? What does geometry tell us? What does non-Euclidean geometry tell us about the nature of, of matter? Uh, I think, I think if you want to grapple with a question like that, uh, uh, you're going to have to think about whether Plato or Aristotle or Epicurus uh, contributes to anything valuable. Uh, I, heard, I heard a little piece uh, just a couple of days ago where Richard Feynman was telling his introductory physics students uh, that uh, the one sentence if you could only preserve one achievement out of all of civilization after some kind of terrible disaster, it would be everything is made out of atoms. Well, not necessarily. Uh, that, that notion of the atom, the, the, the notion that everything is made out of atoms and the notion of atoms that that spawned not universally held anymore. Uh, what can we what we know about the material character of the universe? I'll tell you one thing uh, uh, to the to the questioner, and and then I'll I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleague uh, there in Maryland. Uh, if you if you think that we know all about physics, and you think that we know all about the relationship of the mind to the body, subject that I've written on, uh, you're, you're cheating yourself. 
these are topics that are very open and need further exploration. Uh, and in that exploration, there are things that we can learn from past philosophy. Uh, those ancient Greeks belong to a culture very different from our own. And so do the present day Japanese and the, and the Chinese and the Indians. All these cultures are very different. And out of these cultures come disciplined philosophical inquiries about the, the mind and the body and the nature of matter. I have never met a cosmologist, a physicist who does cosmology, who is not philosophically and indeed usually theologically inclined. That's because they reach the point where dealing with ultimates, in Greek they say archai, which is often vulgarly translated as first principles. But if you really want to know what archai means, archai means ultimates, ultimate causes, ultimate reasons, ultimate explanations, ultimate realities, ultimate values. We have plenty to learn from the ancients, not because they had all the answers, but because we don't. Right. Professor Davis? Uh, yes, I think I can just just briefly. That was a, a really wonderful response, and um, yeah, I, I I want to uh, especially remember the last thing you said. That's a wonderful way of, of of putting it. Not because they have all the answers, but because we don't. Um, and so let me just sort of briefly add. To, there's not there's not much more to sort of add, but uh, I'll add um, two reasons that I think the, the history of philosophy is important. One is is that when we're we're studying the history of uh, of philosophy, let's let's say Western philosophy in this case, we're doing a kind of archaeology of the present. Uh, we're 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 trying to understand where we came from, where uh, um, where our own culture, uh, our own values, our own uh, and yes, science, uh, and along with everything else. Uh, how where did that come from? What were what were the sort of the the conceptual philosophical uh, decisions that were made, not just discoveries made, but also kind of decisions that were made that led to uh, to the present. And that archaeology of the present is also the archaeology of the self. So, in other words, the history of philosophy is, is necessary in order to know thyself. Uh, and, you know, simply like you, again, in an intro to, to Western philosophy course, uh, you know, and, and at uh, Loyola where I teach, it's called Foundations of Philosophy because we emphasize the history of philosophy, uh, the historical foundations and also the conceptual foundations, which are, of course, uh, interrelated because the historical figures laid the conceptual foundations uh, for philosophy. So you're introducing them at the same time. You're introducing metaphysics, epistemology, all these things uh, really should, I think, be introduced historically. Uh, through these uh, studying these texts, but you know, I tell the students you got to start with where they are, right? Sort of a pedagogical as well as a hermeneutical point. And you know, we love the idea of being free, of having freedom, but you're not free if you don't know thyself, right? If you don't know the archaeology of the self, where all of the things that you think are your kind of free day-to-day -day choices, they're not. They're, they've been determined for you by the, the culture, by the language, by, yes, the philosophy uh, that you've been um, inundated with uh, as, you've, uh, as you've grown up. So in other words, doing the history of philosophy is a way of trying to come to terms with all these voices in my head, right? these voices that are me, the voices of me talking to myself, right? the dialogue with the self that uh, Plato uh, says is what philosophy is. Uh, if you want to know where those voices come from, you have to study the history of philosophy because you didn't make them up, right? Nobody, you know, I tell my students, everybody here when they're in their, you know, most solitary of moments is still thinking in English, right? If you're a native English speaker, but nobody created the English language. So if that's, some, if that's you, right? If your values, your language, your concepts, your idea, like if that's what makes you, you, to understand you, to understand, to know thyself, you're going to have to do the archaeology of it. You're going to have to study uh, the history of, of philosophy. So that's the, the first reason that I would give for studying the history of philosophy, 
is knowing thyself and also knowing thy thy culture, knowing thy society, uh, knowing thy world. The second reason, uh, I think, goes along with some of the things that uh, that Professor Goodman was saying, uh, and that is, uh, all along the way, there were forks in the road, and so there's many many paths untaken in these uh, texts of the history of philosophy. So the tradition, right, took a select number of these paths uh, when there's forks in the road, but there's many unexplored. There's many, uh, you know, paths that are unexplored. So, for example, um, after, in my introduction to philosophy class, after showing the paths that were taken up by figures like Augustine, who says, you know, I uh, am confident that I can find in Greek philosophy and in the Platonist, right, uh, philosophy that is not at odds with, with our biblical uh, beliefs, uh, he's taking up a particular path, as it were, and that becomes hugely influential for the, for the Western tradition, as I don't need to tell anybody here. But then, right, uh, after I've convinced them of that, uh, then we turn to Nietzsche, and Nietzsche goes back to the Greeks very differently. Uh, and Nietzsche says, that whole path that was taken, I don't, I don't think that was a good path. I think that was the wrong path on the road. And so he wants to go back and uh, revive figures like Heraclitus, uh, read Plato in a very different way, uh, and even back to Homer, right? I think one of Nietzsche's most programmatic essays is, is his essay, uh, Homer's Contest. Uh, uh, so he's going back to the Greeks, of course, the tragedies we know, the birth of, the tra birth of tragedy, his first book, very differently. So just to use Nietzsche as a case in point where to move forward in the tradition, in this case the Western tradition, we always have to go back, right? You have to go back in order to move forward to tap into these unexplored uh, uh, paths untaken in the Western tradition that are still there richly in the text. I remember the last, last thing I'll say on that is as an example when I was uh, I first met Professor Goodman. I don't know if he remembers me, but I was a, an exiting graduate student when he uh, was an entering, uh, uh, entering from Hawaii, so entering full professor at, at, at Vanderbilt. Uh, I don't know if you remember that or not, but I we I met. Do not. I, I apologize. Yeah, I, I mean, I was finished with courses. I was on my way out, but uh, uh, yeah, you. I actually went to had a meeting with you, and you gave me uh, Graham Parks's email address to contact him because he was at uh, at Hawaii. Yes. Uh, in any case, and Graham, Parks, <laughs> Graham Parks, of course, worked on Heidegger and Eastern Thought, which yes, uh, yes, up your alley. right, exactly. So you uh, you were the uh, the contact uh, that enabled me to get in touch with him. But while while I, while I was at Vanderbilt, um, I studied uh, in part under uh, John Salas, uh, yes, who uh, has done amazing things with Plato. He's a, a, a among other many things. He's a Plato scholar. Uh, and uh, the the uh, dialogue you mentioned, the Timaeus that you're teaching now, he has you know a whole book on this called uh, Chorology. And fascinating for me has been I've actually recently I've got an article coming out where I'm finally sort of coming to terms with Salus's reading of uh, of Plato, but he reads Plato uh, in a way that like the entire tradition has not read Plato. And so the you know the question of 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 whether we even understand Plato is still an alive um, question. Uh, and what are all of the sort of paths untaken that are still in Plato's uh, dialogues uh, that, you know, it's not as if uh, after more than 2,000 years, we've even exhausted that one think that one great thinker, uh, uh, Plato. You're quite right. uh, much less all everything that came, that came after. So the history of philosophy, uh, the, what was the famous, uh, uh, who was it that said, uh, uh, you're going to quote Whitehead? No, uh, well, he, uh, Whitehead says, that, you know, the whole, the whole history of philosophy, right? There's a series of footnotes to Plato, but no, who is it that said, uh, uh, you know, the past is not even past. <laughs> right? Uh, do you know what I'm, what I'm saying? He says, uh, you know, it's history true. is not, uh, it, it's not gone. It's still alive in us and it's still alive with, with lots of different untapped uh, potentialities. I'll stop there, right. I think. All right. Thank you very much. Now we, are, we, we move to the next question, which comes uh, from Mehmet Kuyurtar to Len Goodman. 
and he says, when the, uh, sorry, to Professor Davis, to Professor Davis, this question goes to the Professor Davis, uh, and he says, when the history of science is at stake, uh, uh, Western historians fairly accept uh, the non-Western origins of science. But when philosophy is at stake, why do they insist on the Western origin? Why philosophy is seen as a privileged thing in this sense? Um. Yeah, I mean, great, great point about science, and of course, mathematics has already already been been mentioned. The, uh, the Indian and then then um, Arabic origins of mathematics uh, we know. Uh, but why why philosophy? Yes, I mean, very you know, uh, revealing for me has been the work uh, done by um, folks like I think I have it here. Uh, Folks like uh, Peter Park uh, has has uh, published this interesting, uh, very interesting uh, account of the formation of the philosophical canon at the end of the 18th uh, and beginning of the 19th century. So basically, you know, Kant to, Kant to Hegel, between Kant and Hegel. And what's interesting is he you know, gives a very careful, just goes back to the text to see how uh, uh, what we think of as the history of philosophy uh, we being people who were trained in Western philosophy after this period, so after you know the mid 19th century, it became kind of codified, right? This idea that philosophy, you know, begins with the Greeks or begins with the pre-Socratics, uh, and there's this real cesura, you know, between what came before, uh, you know, what what they borrowed from Egypt or uh, from Persia, uh, or maybe through Persia um, uh, from India is uh, sort of cut off, you know, and said, no, but it really, you know, it starts uh, with the Greeks uh, and then it has been exclusively uh, developed in the Western uh, uh, European tradition. So kind of this, this Greeks to the Germans thing, the Greeks to the Germans as being the kind of, you know, uh, 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 exclusive kind of history of philosophy. That whole idea was, uh, was not uh, the accepted uh, was not the doxa so to speak until this period until these very specific um, historians of philosophy who were who were Kantians and Kant himself to some extent but these historians of philosophy uh, created that that uh, idea of the history of philosophy and uh, what's really important is all of the the kind of racism and uh, chauvinism uh, and uh, sort of desire to exclude um, uh, non-Western peoples, uh, as well as um, uh, as cultures, and you know, you you know all of the, uh, you know that uh, the Kant's uh, racism, Kant's contribution to the the whole idea, the false scientific idea of race. Uh, Kant is hugely influential on the uh, the false scientific uh, development, the false scientific idea of race, and Kant famously thought that only uh, white Europeans were capable of philosophy. Uh, and so if, you know, if you start with that idea, then you kind of can't allow that these non-European places are going to, to have, uh, have philosophy. And so I think, you know, we have to take seriously what, you know, what are the motivations for the development of this exclusively Western uh, idea of philosophy, this philosophical Euro monopolism, uh, as, I, as I called it. Uh, and we're going to have to sort of, you know, first of all, unearth all of these uh, racist, xenophobic, um, uh, this is the heyday of, of, of colonialism, right? So it's right when they're really, ex they're experiencing all of their, there's more to the world than just the, the, uh, the Western tradition. And um, uh, it's, it's a kind of retrenchment or reaction uh, to that. Uh, a bit earlier, there was much more openness, as you know, Leibniz, uh, keen interest in, in Chinese uh, philosophy, um, the r romantics, uh, you know, keen interest in Indian uh, philosophy. And so I think this is a kind of retrenchment, right? a kind of retrenchment uh, uh, on the part of, of more Eurocentrically oriented uh, um, people. So I think we have to look at those uh, motivations uh, for 
for why this happened uh, in order to then, you know, even start to rethink, well, how, how should we think about this, this term uh, philosophy and uh, the history or histories uh, of philosophy uh, today? I'll stop there. Right. All right, thank you. Uh, next question is also uh, to you, Professor Davis, and from Chafik Grauger. And he is asking, is there anything like Western humanism in Japanese history? Rather anything like, question. yes, anything like Western humanism. Yes, I mean, I think again, you know, we have to to realize um, where our own ideas come from, right? So we have to to do the work that that you know Professor Goodman and others are doing <laughs> to explore, you know, what is the Western history of that term of humanism? Uh, how is uh, you know humanism part uh, the, the term humanism? How did it develop as part of uh, of the Renaissance, right? Of uh, how is it you know in this kind of tension with uh, with uh, more theocentric ways of thinking and how is it you know the kind of rediscovery discovery and reappreciation of uh, of the human you know in uh, uh, in in art and as well as in philosophy and only then right when we really kind of have a rich understanding of what we mean by humanism uh, can we then look to other traditions and say well do they have something that is um, is uh, similar and I think the answer then is 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 yes, and there's lots of interesting you know, things to explore um, in the Japanese tradition. Uh, yes, but also going all the way back uh, to the the earliest um, Chinese uh, uh, philosophical text, uh, where there's there's a very interesting um, you know when uh, when uh, Western uh, missionaries uh, came to to China, Jesuit and other missionaries. Uh, this sort of question of like, did these do these people already know about God? Right? Do they are is it already sort of there in the tradition, or maybe they don't, uh, and so it has to be introduced. Uh, and in Japan as well, that was a you know a big sort of question. Uh, very interesting like stories about the first um, Japanese uh, mission, uh, sorry, Western uh, missionaries to Japan uh, used uh, the term uh, uh, Dainichi. Uh, which is the great sun Buddha, as a translation of Deus, of, of God. And so you had, um, you, you had Jesuit missionaries going around the streets of Japan saying, pray to Dainichi Buddha, pray to Dainichi Buddha, you know, because they, they, they thought this is, you know, they, they actually thought, there's even a whole tradition that a lost uh, uh, tribe of Israel went, went to Japan and introduced uh, monotheism there. And so there's a lot of sort of mutual misunderstanding. The Japanese, for their part, thought, that the missionaries were bringing the latest news from the land of the West, which for, for them was, was India. So they thought they were bringing new versions of Buddhism, new schools of Buddhism to them. So lots of hermeneutic sort of misunderstanding. But um, to go back to the question of humanism, though, uh, there is you know sort of long tradition going all the way back to early China where the early earliest Chinese did know something of, of a kind of monotheistic understanding of um, of the divine, uh, which they called the celestial uh, emperor, the Tian Di, the celestial emperor. Uh, but then, interesting, as the early tradition, so we're talking about fourth century, around fourth century uh, uh, BCE, uh, Chinese philosophers were developing their their thinking. There was really a movement away from a kind of personified idea, a kind of uh, anthropomorphic idea of kind of God as a person a person up in the in the heavens and there became a much more what a, was going to appear to westernize as a kind of humanistic understanding of uh, of philosophy which still understands there to be kind of um, uh, principles and they associate these principles with with heaven with Tian but now Tian or heaven is not thought of as, as a kind of personified deity so much as it is a kind of um, you know, source of the rational principles that structure uh, the universe, uh, and so I think it would be an interesting sort of sort of project to uh, take Western humanism and you know early early Chinese philosophical humanism. It's also often presented uh, as humanistic, 
uh, and to compare and contrast and engage in a dialogue between the, those two, two traditions. Thank you for the question. All right. The next question is again from Mehmet Kuyurtar to Professor Goodman. And he says, from the point of view of the basic concept of your book, namely Islamic humanism, how do you evaluate today's Islamic thought? Or how do you evaluate uh, the thought that occupies Islamic world today? I'm afraid that goes beyond my expertise. I don't know today's right. Islamic thought. I, I know a little about the past and a little about the future. And uh, I have not uh, devoted myself to the study of uh, Islamic thinking. Uh, uh, so, so I'm going to have to plead ignorance on that one. And uh, I, I think uh, I, I mentioned uh, uh, some thinkers like uh, Muhammad Arkun. Uh, who is a, a, a very recent figure and uh, who, who has a, a deep commitment to the heritage of Islamic humanism. Uh, and uh, I, was, I was good friends uh, uh, un, until the time of his death with uh, Majid Fahri, uh, who was um, uh, a Christian, but a Christian who took Islamic philosophy very uh, seriously, uh, and uh, uh, and and uh, translated the Quran and uh, wrote a wonderful book about uh, Islamic occasionalism and its critique by Averroes and Aquinas. Uh, very intro wrote, wrote a wonderful book about Islamic ethics, uh, also trying to uh, bring back to life uh, some of those some of those uh, traditions. But uh, but I I am not uh, I am not an expert on uh, Islamic thought today, and uh, I think I think there are there are efforts being made, but one of the problems that you have if you're uh, an Islamic thinker today, Razi and Al Farabi had more intellectual freedom than many people would do in countries where the where the cultural uh, uh, openness uh, does not exist in the way that would foster that kind of humanism. I think, uh, and, and I, I, I hasten to specify that uh, by humanism, I don't mean it the way the, uh, the, the uh, <laughs> You know there are there are organizations in uh, the United States who who call themselves humanists, meaning that they don't believe in God. That's uh, that's not going to be the Islamic form of humanism, or the Jewish form of humanism, or the Christian form of humanism. Uh, it's going to be an idea of of a kind of ethical and spiritual harmony between humanity and the divine, but. Uh, but it would be very, very difficult uh, of, to develop that kind of tradition. Look, the Ikhwan Safa had to do it more or less underground. Uh, Al-Kindi uh, was OK for a while, and then he winds up in jail. Uh, Ibn Rushd uh, of Eroes got exiled uh, for a while and had to uh, sort of uh, uh, produce a work uh, that, that was uh, catering to the oppressive environment that was established by the Almohads. Some of what's going on in Iran today and in other places where the dominant culture is Islamic uh, is, is, uh, is going to be repressive of that kind of thinking. And one of the problems that you have uh, in that kind of environment is that rather than uh, opening oneself up to the full richness of the tradition, those thinkers who are uh, at odds with that repressive environment, which operates in the name of Islam, uh, is that they uh, 
they attach themselves to Marxism in one of its varieties or to existentialism in one of its varieties, uh, and they become very derivative uh, rather than free and original thinkers. Uh, that's one of the reasons I haven't studied them sufficiently. Uh, I haven't found the philosophical richness that, uh, that I would hope for uh, would be emergent uh, in, in Islamic countries and um, Islamicate countries, let's say. Uh, so I have, I, have, I have hopes, but uh, uh, look, uh, uh, one doesn't need, in the 19th century, one doesn't need to read Arabic literature in order to think about Herbert Spencer. And in the 20th century, one doesn't need to read Arabic literature to write, to read about Sartre. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to see uh, greater freedom emergent in uh, Islamic uh, society today. And I think uh, that meetings of the kind that we're engaged in right now uh, are the sort of thing that will encourage that, that development. Uh, where where people feel free enough to um, profit from uh, their own tradition and from the larger world tradition of which their own tradition has been an important part. Uh, uh, so that's that that's my answer by way of excuse of my ignorance. All right, thank you. Let's move to the next question. We have got from the same person, two questions. One is for Professor Davis, another one is pro to Professor Goodman. Let's start with the Davis. Uh, uh, Sumeye Shen is asking you and with, with uh, some uh, 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 comments. And she says, given that different definitions of philosophy, given that there are, or, uh, uh, there are different definitions of philosophy, does this mean that philosophy cannot be universal? And, and that means that uh, talking about philosophy as cultural or subjective ground, it would not make philosophy informative, rather it would make it a spirative or make it an enterprise that provides some ideas rather than universal. Is that a problem for you? I don't know. Um, yes. Um, yes. So I think if you, if you ask whether, uh, philosophy is particular or universal, that neither one of those options is going to, um, is going to be satisfactory. Uh, because if you ask, you know, whether it's, it's universal, a particular philosophy, uh, then you're absolutizing a particular, um, uh, perspective, right? Then you're you're taking a certain language, a certain culture, a certain tradition, a certain thinker, a certain system, uh, and you're saying this is the one true. Uh, you know, this uh, everything else is is false, and this is the only thing that that's true. Um, or you take a you know whole tradition, like let's say the Western tradition. You say only you know philosophy can only be done in Western languages. It can only be done you know with these texts and, and so forth. So I, I, you know, that's clear from my paper that I think that's very problematic. On the other hand, and this is, I think, where the question comes from, and it's a, a good question, is the alternative to, to uh, a kind of relativism, where you say, well, okay, so there is no one tradition of philosophy. We only have, uh, you know, as Diltai says, there's no philosophy, only philosophies. There's no, you know, one definition of philosophy, there's only many different versions uh, and, def and methods and uh, as well as content and aims uh, of philosophy fees. Um, but I think that's, you know, problematic as well. And that there you're um, running the, uh, the danger of uh, what I called philosophical suicide, right? Where, you know, when, uh, when the proposal is made to, uh, to uh, philos philosophy departments in the United States, you know, you can either open yourselves up to include other traditions, non-Western traditions of philosophy, or you need to at least rename yourselves. 
right? So if you're only going to offer courses in Western philosophy, you should rename yourselves, um, you know, uh, Department of Western Philosophy. And that's a possible way to go, but I don't think many philosophy departments are going to do that because that's, the, you know, entails a kind of philosophical suicide if you say, okay, we're only interested in philosophy and so far as it's done in this particular tradition or in this particular way, right? You lose the universal thrust of philosophy. So what is the third option then? Is there a third option? Uh, you know, if it's a multiple choice test, uh, you know, you should demand a C. If you're only given a B, an A and a B choice, you know, uh, is philosophy universal or is it particular? You should demand a C uh, option. And I think the C option is something like all we ever have are particular approaches to universality. So any philosophical tradition, it seems to me, is uh, aiming at, at universal truth, is aiming at something that would not just apply to them, right? So if, uh, if someone says, well, this way of thinking uh, only applies to Japanese people, well, then I, I say, well, okay, then, you know, have fun with that, but it doesn't apply to me, so I'm not, I'm not interested in it. You're telling me it doesn't apply to me. But if some uh, Japanese person says, no, we have some ideas that are rooted in our culture and our tradition, uh, but we think they're, uh, they have universal significance. We think that everybody can, can learn uh, from them. Uh, you know, maybe certain, certain things that um, are clearer when you think, of, think about them from this tradition. Uh, and once you see that, then you're, you're like, oh, that does apply to me. So that's what I would call a particular approach to universality. Uh, and I think that's all we ever have. So for example- Let me, let me, let me put in a word here, if I may, Brett. Uh, think about the history of art and design. Mm -hmm. when, when thinkers like, uh, when, when painters like Monet discovered Japanese art, that had a profound influence on him. He didn't end up imitating Japanese art, but he learned from it because he could see what was going on there. And he, he introduced motifs. Uh, there was a different idiom corresponding, if you will, to a different language. But the notion of a mindset was foreign to somebody who was exploring. If you think of philosophy as an open inquiry, that's where the universality can come in. One of the interesting things, if you read about Hokusai, Hokusai had exposure to, um, he saw some postcards from the West. And these postcards were using vanishing point perspective, which until then did not exist in traditional Japanese art. But being an artist, he called himself mad for art. Um, being an artist, he saw immediately what was going on in those postcards and started using those ideas in his own art. Uh, it, it leapt across that intercultural barrier. Uh, and so you can start seeing uh, the use of perspective in Hokusai's art in, in very original and creative ways because he's going to assimilate it to his own practice and his own tradition. Uh, he's not just imitating what he found in the very early work of ukiyo-e painters and, and printmakers, uh, but, but he's um, going on and doing creative things of his own. And when he sees it, it only took a couple of postcards. Ah, I get it. I see what they're doing. That's a very interesting idea. And he, and he tries out to see what he can do with it. And that's something that you find in philosophy as well. That's where the cosmopolitanism uh, feeds the kind of humanism that, that, that I'm interested in, where, where uh, you have that leaping across uh, cultural barriers, linguistic barriers, barriers of difference of idiom and, and uh, background and even problematics. Uh, Buddhists and Hindus uh, and Christians uh, don't just have different answers, they have different questions. And uh, uh, sometimes we have to realize that uh, the other person might have um, 
a question one hadn't thought to ask that's still worth asking. Uh, that, that I think is, is uh, where the universality comes in, not as a, um, a kind of Procrustean bed or, or a kind of straitjacket that, that you, know, you put yourself into because, be, because, oh, this is the way it's done. There's more than one way it's done. And realizing that is, is, is the key to uh, universality, uh, not universality uh, in the imperialist sense, uh, whether invitational or exclusionary. Yeah, I, I very much agree. And I would ju I just shortly add um, that Hokusai was a great example because that's such a good example of, uh, of cross-cultural going both ways. And, and you can add, uh, yes. you know, Van Gogh on the Western side, you know, to, yes. uh, it's, you know, fascinating. And I would just add the the last point I was going to make. Um, it, it's it's uh, it can be made in terms of art as well. Uh, there's never been a painting that was painted in no style whatsoever, right? Just like there's never been a text that was written in no language whatsoever. So our you know artistic styles uh, and our um, our texts always have that particularity to them. But that doesn't mean, and I echo Professor Goodman's point here, that doesn't mean they're closed in on themselves, right? Texts can be translated, and that's a creative, uh, that's a, that's a, you know, a, a creative process. Uh, just as, as, as the wonderful example of, of Hokusai there, just as artistic painting styles can, can be translated, as it were, and that too is a, is a, is a creative process. And I, I agree, that's where the universality comes from, is that, that, um, uh, cosmopolitan dialogue, as it were, that opens up uh, in that space. All right. Uh, our last question again comes from Smeye Shen to Professor Goodman. And she says, Ikhwan al Safa makes animals speak and they complain about humans. On the other hand, there is an Islamic tradition which involves sacrifice of animals during sacrifice feasts every year. And here is, here is here she, she, her question. If we look at the issue only in this context, what is the status of animals who are sacrificed? According uh, uh, status of animals that are sacrificed where? According, during the uh, uh, sacrifice feast every year. Um, I, I, she says, the, the question on, the, on the one hand, says, on the one hand, Ikhwan El Safa uh, 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 makes animals speak, and those animals complain about human treatment uh, against them. Yes. yes. And she says, on the other hand, there is an Islamic tradition which involves sacrifice of animals during the sure. sacrifice feast every year. Yes. Which, you know, and she says, here, here is the question of her, and she says, if you look at the issue only in this context, what is the status of animals who are sacrificed? Yes. For this tradition? I can, I can attempt to answer that, but Neither I nor the Ikhwana Safa are writing as uh, Muslim theologians. So uh, we're not writing about the, uh, the rights and wrongs of animal sacrifice. However, the question is raised in that book, and I would invite the questioner to read the, uh, the book. It's a very uh, interesting book, and there's an extensive commentary um, uh, because uh, uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of that book that the Juana Safab wrote was um, influenced by Porphyry's uh, work, uh, De Abstinentia, which is on abstinence from animal food. Uh, and you'll find that in the commentary that uh, we wrote on that work. Uh, I can tell you uh, that the Mutazilites uh, worried a lot about that question, and they had an answer to it. Uh, which might surprise the questioner. Uh, their answer was that if any animal has suffered uh, unduly as a result of being sacrificed, um, that will be made up to that animal uh, in the hereafter. 
Uh, this was a, a, a striking and to some people a shocking answer. And the notion that it's not just human souls, but animal souls that, that need to be requited for undeserved sufferings uh, was uh, uh, certainly not a traditional Islamic view. On the other hand, the Mutazilites were a, uh, a, a major is Islamic school of thought, of, 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 uh, of theology. Uh, and uh, the Jewish thinker, uh, Saja, uh, who is uh, roughly contemporary with al-Ashari, uh, he died in 944, so, uh, al-Ashari died in 935 uh, of the common era. Uh, Saja picked up this idea from the Mutazilites and uh, he, he liked the idea and, and used it because as the questioner knows, the, uh, the biblical tradition has a lot of sacrifice of animals too. Um, in the case of Maimonides, Maimonides dismisses that view of Saja. He thinks it's absurd uh, to say that animals will be requited, that, that God has to look out for their interests. But uh, he lives in a period when the ancient biblical uh, cult of sacrifice had been in disuse for um, over a thousand years and um, with the destruction of the temple in 70 of the common era and he's writing uh, uh, 1100 years after that uh, so it's more of an academic question for him and he treats animal sacrifice as an accommodation of the primitive piety of the ancient israelites they were already being asked to change their notion of god and the place where they lived and their uh, all kinds of changes were taking place, and it would be too much for them to have to change the mode of worship, which was traditionally animal sacrifice. So he thinks that it was heavily regulated, only in this place, only at these times, and so forth. Um, it's pretty clear that, uh, that he would not uh, particularly uh, countenance uh, that, that aberration. But there it is, it's in the Bible, and he thinks that when the Messiah comes, maybe certain reforms will be made. Uh, the, the real issue that um, the question boils down to for Ikhwan Asafa is whether humans are better than animals. And for them, that does not turn on the issue of whether animals can be eaten or whether animals can be used for beasts of burden or for riding or for sport or, or, or any of those questions. Uh, they satirize human practices in that regard, but they don't uh, attempt to devalorize them either. They just, they just think that those are various weaknesses of human beings uh, as seen from the perspective of the animals. However, uh, if the questioner reads the book, and I'm not going to spoil the end for you, uh, you will find out the grounds on which, after all the human pretensions to superiority of animals have been dismissed by way of good philosophical arguments that the animals bring, there's one, one dimension of human nature which comes up almost by accident at the very end of the book, uh, which leads the king of the jinn to say, well, uh, much to the surprise of everyone who reads the book, well, I've got to admit that, um, that in this respect, uh, the humans have a kind of superiority over the animals and uh, therefore uh, case dismissed, the, the animals aren't going to make it. Uh, I, I tell you, uh, that I'm not going to reveal what that characteristic was, <laughs> because you got to read the book to find that out. But uh, I will, I will tell you that uh, if you read any of the printed versions before the one that the um, uh, Oxford University Press published for us, ours is a critical edition. We used we used two dozen uh, Arabic manuscripts. And there were many, many more that we could choose from because this was one of the most popular Arabic books uh, of the Middle Ages. Uh, but in the critical edition, uh, that is the way the dialogue, the, the, the court case of the animals versus man ends. If you read one of the printed editions that was done before our critical edition, you'll find a tacked on ending, which is less surprising. Uh, so, uh, 
be sure and read the critical edition in this case. We've got the Arabic there if you buy the hardcover or uh, the English translation, uh, which is, which is uh, uh, present on facing pages in the hardcover or present uh, if, you're, if you're a student, uh, you can get the paperback which doesn't have the Arabic and the color illustrations that we put in from the manuscripts that we used. But uh, uh, the ending, the ending is always surprising. I'll tell you one thing about my own teaching because I was teaching that book last semester. I uh, organized my students to have a debate uh, between the advocates of the animals and the advocates of the human beings. And uh, one of the graduate students said, I presided over the debate. I was the king of the gin and, and he was the uh, wazir. And, uh, uh, the, de this, the nature of the debate was to appeal the, the final decision of the king of the jinn. Uh, we were in appeals court and we, uh, and we had to consider that because that ending comes very suddenly and very shockingly. Uh, it's not what you'd expect after all the criticisms of human pretensions have been made. Uh, but but you, have to, you have to find out. But, but I, I, uh, going back to the original question, uh, the issue of ritual sacrifices of animals is not a central concern of the, uh, even of the animals, they don't make a big deal out of that. They, they don't particularly like the fact that they get eaten or that they get beaten by uh, camel drivers and ox drivers and ass drivers and so forth. Uh, but they, uh, they're more concerned with abuse. Um, some wonderful, wonderful uh, passages in there. And I, one of the things that's most delightful about that book and one of the reasons that that work was so popular uh, in the Middle Ages and since and translated into Hebrew, into Urdu and many other languages, one of the reasons it was so popular is because it's written with humor. It is not a heavy, not a heavy handed book, even when it's at its most serious. All right, thank you very much, you both. Uh, Professor Brett Davis and Professor Len Goodman uh, for your wonderful talks you have given to us. And there are some more questions, but unfortunately we exceed time. And I apologize for those, uh, those questions we couldn't uh, consider. All right, and we finished. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, as the host of this session, I want to thank you both Professor Davis and Professor Goodman on the on the behalf of the University Philosophy Department for your great speeches and also your very explanatory answer, answers to the questions. Uh, and of course, uh, thank you for all the attendants for joining our symposium, being with us today and for your questions also. Uh, we are just ending this session now, and thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Closing. Kapatıyorum. Tamamdır. Teşekkürler hepinize.